From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Sunday afternoon session of the 186th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Our dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the concluding session of the 186th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, who presides at the conference, has asked that I conduct this session. We extend our greetings to members of the church and friends everywhere in this global and worldwide conference who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy with Linda Margetz at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. The invocation will then be offered by Elder C. Scott Grow of the Seventy.
Our Father in heaven, with humble hearts and with gratitude, we approach Thee now as we begin this final session of General Conference. We're grateful for Thy Spirit that has been poured out in abundance upon us in these previous sessions. We thank Thee for the restoration of the gospel and for the Church of Jesus Christ in these latter days through the prophet Joseph Smith. We thank Thee for the keys of the kingdom of God that have been restored to the earth for the priesthood power and authority that allows us to enter into the ordinances of exaltation and enter into sacred covenants with Thee, especially in Thy holy temples. We rejoice today in the announcement of four new temples. We thank Thee for living apostles and prophets to guide us in these latter days. We pray a special blessing to be poured out upon each of them and sustain them in their ministries, and especially our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, whom we love. We thank Thee for the life and mission and ministry of Thy Son, for His atoning sacrifice, and for His glorious resurrection. Now, Father, as we begin this final session, we pray that Thou wilt pour out Thy Spirit upon each of us, <clears throat> those in the choir, those who will speak to us, and each one of us who will hear here in this sacred hall and throughout the world. Bless us with increased faith in Thy Son, Jesus Christ, and in Thee, and increase our determination to seek to know Thy will, and with the increased ability to do Thy will. From this day forward, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The choir will now favor us with, For I am called by thy name. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Gary W. Gong of the Presidency of the Seventy. Elder Patrick Cairn of the Seventy will then address us. My beloved brothers and sisters, I speak today as a servant of the Lord and also as a great-grandfather. To you and to my beloved posterity, I teach and bear testimony of the remarkable gift of the Holy Ghost. I begin by acknowledging the light of Christ, 
which is given to every man and woman that cometh into the world. All of us benefit from this holy light. It is and all through and it is it is in all things and through all things and allows us to distinguish right from wrong. But the Holy Ghost is different than the light of Christ. He is the third member of the Godhead, a distinct personage of spirit with sacred responsibilities and one in purpose with the Father and the Son. As members of the Church, we may experience the companionship of the Holy Ghost continually. Through the restored priesthood of God, we are baptized by immersion for the remission of our sins, then confirmed members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In this ordinance, we are given the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands of the priesthood, and thereafter we can receive and retain the companionship of the Holy Ghost by always remembering the Savior, keeping His commandments, repenting of our sins, and worthily partaking of the sacrament on the Sabbath day. The Holy Ghost provides personal revelation to help us make major life decisions about such things as education, missions, careers, marriage, children, where we will live with our families, and so on. In these matters, Heavenly Father expects us to use our agency, study the situation out in our minds according to gospel principles, and bring a decision to Him in prayer. Personal revelation is essential, but is only one part of the work of the Holy Ghost. As the scriptures attest, the Holy Ghost also testifies of the Savior and God the Father. He teaches us the peaceable things of the kingdom and causes us, us to abound in hope. He leadeth us to do good and to judge righteously. He gives to every man and woman a spiritual gift that all may be profited thereby. He giveth us knowledge and bring things all to our remembrance. Through the Holy Ghost, we may be sanctified and receive a remission of our sins. He is the Comforter, the same who was promised unto the Savior's disciples. I remember all of us. I might remind all of us that the Holy Ghost is not given to control us. Some of us unwisely seek the Holy Ghost's direction on every minor decision in our life. This trivializes His sacred role. The Holy Ghost honors the principle of agency. He speaks out to our minds and our hearts gently about many matters of consequence. Each of us may feel the influence of the Holy Ghost differently. His promptings will be felt in different degrees of intensity according to our individual needs and circumstances. In these latter days, we affirm that only the prophet may receive revelation through the Holy Ghost for the entire Church. Some forget this, as when Aaron and Miriam tried to convince Moses to agree with them, but the Lord taught them and us. He said, If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him. With him will I speak mouth to mouth." Close quote. Sometimes the adversary tempts us with false ideas that we may confuse with the Holy Ghost. I testify that faithfulness in obeying the commandments 
and keeping our covenants will protect us from being deceived. Through the Holy Ghost, we'll be able to discern those false prophets who teach for the doctrine and the commandments of men. As we receive the Holy Ghost for ourselves, it is wise to remember that we cannot receive revelation for ourselves or for others, I mean. I know of a young man who told a young woman, I've had a dream. You're to be my wife. <laughs> you got it. The young woman pondered that statement and then replied and responded, when I have the same dream, I'll come and talk to you. <laughs> All of us may be tempted to let our personal desires overcome the guidance of the Holy Ghost. The Prophet Joseph Smith pled with Heavenly Father for permission to lend the first 116 pages of the Book of Mormon to Martin Harris. Joseph thought it was a good idea, but the Holy Ghost did not give him confirming feelings. Eventually, Joseph lent the papers anyway, and Martin Smith, Martin Harris lost them. For a season, the Lord withdrew the prophet's gift to translate, and he learned a painful but valuable lesson that shaped the remainder of his service. The Holy Ghost is central to the Restoration regarding his boyhood reading of James 1 and 5, the prophet Joseph recounted, never did any passage of the scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. The power described by Holy Ghost, by Joseph Smith, was the influence of the Holy Ghost. As a result, Joseph went into a grove of trees near his home, knelt down to ask of God. The first vision then followed was truly momentous and magnificent, but the path to the in-person in visitation with the Father and the Son began with the promptings from the Holy Ghost to pray. The revealed truths of the restored gospel came through the pattern of seeking and prayer, then receiving and following the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Consider these examples, translating the Book of Mormon, the restoration of the priesthood and its ordinances, beginning with baptism and the organization of the Church, to name a few. I testify that today, revelation from the Lord to the First Presidency and the Twelve comes according to these same sacred patterns. These are the same sacred patterns that allow personal revelation. We pay tribute to all who have followed the Holy Ghost to receive the restored gospel, beginning with Joseph Smith's own family members. When young Joseph told his father about Moroni's visit, his father received a confirming witness for himself. Immediately, Joseph was released from his farm responsibilities and encouraged to follow the angel's direction. As parents and leaders, let us do likewise. Let us encourage our children and others to follow the direction of the Holy Ghost. In doing so, let us follow the example of the Holy Ghost ourselves, leading through gentleness, meekness, kindness, long-suffering, and love unfeigned. The Holy Ghost is a member, a medium for God's work in families and throughout the Church. With that understanding, may I share a few personal examples of the Holy Ghost in my own life and Church service. I offer them as a personal witness that the Holy Ghost blesses us all. Many years ago, Sister Hales and I planned to host some of my work associates 
had a special dinner at my home, at our home. In my way home from the office, I had an impression to stop at the house of a widow whom I hope taught. When I knocked on the sister door, she said, I have been praying for you to come. Where did that impression come from? The Holy Ghost. Once following a serious illness, I presided at a state conference. To conserve my energy, I planned to leave the chapel immediately after the priest leadership session. However, following the benediction, I was inspired to shake hands. In fact, the Holy Ghost said to me, Where are you going? I was inspired to shake hands with everyone as they left the room. As one young elder stepped forward, I was prompted to give him this special message. He was looking down, and I waited for his eyes to come up and meet mine, and I was able to say, Pray to the Heavenly Father. Listen to the Holy Ghost. Follow the promptings you are given, and all will be well in your life." End of quote. Later, the stake president told me how the young man had just returned early from his mission. Based on a clear impression, the stake president had promised the young man's father that if he brought his son to the priesthood meeting, Elder Hales would speak to him. Why did I stop and shake everybody's hand? Why did I pause to talk to this special young man? What was the source of my counsel? It's simple, the Holy Ghost. In early 2005, I was guided to prepare a conference message about senior missionary couples Following the conference, a brother recounted, As we listened to the conference, immediately the Spirit of the Lord touched my very soul. There was no mistake the message was for me and for my sweetheart. We were to serve a mission, and the time was now. When I looked at my wife, I realized that she had received, received the very same impression from the Spirit. End of quote. What had brought this strong, simultaneous response? The Holy Ghost. To my own posterity and all within the sound of my voice, I offer my testimony of the personal revelation and constant flow of daily guidance and caution, encouragement, strength, spiritual cleansing, comfort, and peace that have come to our family through the Holy Ghost. Through the Holy Ghost, we experience the multitude of His tender mercies and miracles that do not cease. I bear my special witness that the Savior lives. I express my love and gratitude to Heavenly Father for the gift of the Holy Ghost, through which reveals His will and sustains us in our life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dear brothers and sisters, when I served in Asia, people sometimes asked, Elder Gong, how many people live in the Asia area of the church? I said, half the world's population, 3.6 billion people. Someone asked, is it hard to remember all their names? <laughs> Remembering and forgetting are part of everyday life. 
For example, once after looking everywhere for her new mobile phone, my wife finally decided to call it from another phone. When she heard her phone ring, my wife thought, who could be calling me? I haven't given that number to anyone. <laughs> Remembering and forgetting are also part of our eternal journey. Time, agency, and memory help us learn, grow, and increase in faith. In the words of a favorite hymn, we'll sing all hail to Jesus' name and praise and honor give. Ye saints, partake and testify, ye do remember him. Each week in partaking of the sacrament, we covenant to always remember him. Drawing on a few of the more than 400 scripture references to the word remember, here are six ways we can always remember him. First, we can always remember him by having confidence in his covenants, promises, and assurances. The Lord remembers his everlasting covenants from Adam's time to the day Adam's posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward. Then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. The Lord remembers his promises, including promises to gather scattered Israel through the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, and promises given to every member and missionary who remembers the worth of souls. The Lord remembers and assures nations and peoples in these days of motion and commotion, some trust in horses, some in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God who guides the future as he has the past. In perilous times, we remember that it is not the word of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. Second, we can always remember him by gratefully acknowledging his hand throughout our lives. The Lord's hand is often clearest in our lives in hindsight. As Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard put it, life must be understood backward, but it must be lived forward. My dear mother recently celebrated her 90th birthday. She gratefully testified of God's blessing at each major junction in her life. Family histories, family traditions, and family ties help us save a remembrance of things past while providing future patterns and hope. Priesthood lines of authority and patriarchal blessings witness God's hand across generations. Have you ever thought of yourself as your own living book of remembrance, reflecting what and how you choose to remember? For example, when I was younger, I really wanted to play school basketball. I practiced and practiced. One day, the coach pointed to our six-foot forward all-state center and our six-foot-two all-star forward and said to me, I can put you on the team, but you'll likely never play. I remember how kindly he then encouraged, why not try out for soccer? You'd be good. My family cheered when I scored my first goal. We can remember those who give us a chance and a second chance with honesty, kindness, patience, and encouragement. And we can become someone others remember when they most needed help, gratefully remembering the assistance of others and the Spirit's guiding influence is a way we remember Him. It's a way we count our many blessings and see what God hath done. Third, we can always remember Him by trusting when the Lord assures us, He who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. When we fully repent, including by confessing and forsaking our sins, we ask with Enos, as our guilt is swept away, Lord, how is it done? And hear the answer, because of thy faith in Christ and his invitation to put me in remembrance. Once we repent and priesthood leaders declare us worthy, we need not continue to confess and confess these past sins. To be worthy does not mean to be perfect. His plan of happiness invites us to be humbly at peace on our life's journey to someday become perfected in Christ, not constantly worried, frustrated, or unhappy in our imperfections today. Remember, he knows all the things we don't want anyone else to know about us and loves us still. Sometimes life 
tests our trust in Christ's mercy, justice, and judgment, and in his liberating invitation to allow his atonement to heal us as we forgive others and ourselves. A young woman in another country applied to work as a journalist, but the official who assigned jobs was merciless. He said to her, with my signature, I guarantee you will not become a journalist, but will dig sewers. Imagine being the only woman digging sewers in a gang of men. Years later, this woman became an official. One day, a man came in needing her signature for a job. She asked, do you remember me? He did not. She said, you do not remember me, but I remember you. With your signature, you guaranteed I never became a journalist. With your signature, you sent me to dig sewers, the only woman in a gang of men. She told me, I feel I should treat that man better than he treated me, but I do not have that strength. Sometimes that strength is not within us, but it can be found in remembering the atonement of our Savior Jesus Christ. When trust is betrayed, dreams broken, hearts shattered and then broken again, when we want justice and need mercy, when our fists clench and our tears flow, when we need to know what to hold on to and what to let go of, we can always remember him. Life is not as cruel as it can sometimes seem. His infinite compassion can help us find our way, truth, and life. When we remember his words and example, we will not give or take offense. My friend's father worked as a mechanic. His honest labor showed even in his carefully washed hands. One day, someone at a temple told my friend's father he should clean his hands before serving in the temple. Instead of being offended, this good man began to scrub the family dishes by hand with extra soapy water before attending the temple. He exemplifies those who ascend until the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place with the cleanest of hands and the purest of hearts. If we have unkind feelings, grudges, or resentments, or if we have cause to ask forgiveness of others, now is the time to do so. Fourth, he invites us to remember that he always welcomes us home. We learn by asking and searching, but please do not cease exploration until you arrive, in the words of T.S. Eliot, quote, where you started and know the place for the first time. When you are ready, please open your heart to the Book of Mormon again for the first time. Please pray, pray with real intent again for the first time. Trust that early or faint memory. Let it enlarge your faith. With God, there is no point of no return. Prophets ancient and modern implore us not to let human foibles, faults, or weaknesses, others or our own, cause us to miss the truth, covenants, and redeeming power in his restored gospel. This is especially important in a church where we each grow through our imperfect participation. The prophet Joseph said, I never told you I was perfect, but there is no error in the revelations which I have taught. Fifth, we can always remember him on the Sabbath through the sacrament. At the end of his mortal ministry and the beginning of his resurrected ministry, both times, our Savior took bread and wine and asked that we remember his body and blood. For as oft as ye do this, you will remember this hour that I was with you. In the ordinance of the sacrament, we witness unto God the Father that we are willing to take upon us the name of his Son and always remember him and keep his commandments, which he has given us, that we may always have his spirit to be with us. As Amulek teaches, we remember him when we pray over our fields, our flocks, and our households, and when we remember the needy, the naked, the sick, and the afflicted. Finally, six. Our Savior invites us to always remember him as he always remembers us. In the new world, our resurrected Savior invited those present to come, one by one, to thrust their hands into his side 
and to feel the prints in his hands and in his feet. The scriptures describe resurrection as every limb and joint shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame, and even a hair of the head shall not be lost. That being so, please consider how it is that our Savior's perfect resurrected body still bears the wounds in his side and the nail prints in his hands and feet. At times in history, mortal men have been executed by crucifixion, but only our Savior Jesus Christ embraces us, still carrying the marks of his pure love. Only he fulfills the prophecy of being lifted up upon the cross that he might draw each of us by name to him. Our Savior declares, yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. He testifies, I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God, end quote. I humbly testify and pray that we will always remember him in all times, all things, and all places we may be in. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For I was unhungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. There are an estimated 60 million refugees in the world today, which means that one in every 122 humans has been forced to flee their homes. And half of these are children. It's shocking to consider the numbers involved and to reflect on what this means in each individual life. My current assignment is in Europe, where one and a quarter million of these refugees have arrived over the last year from war-torn parts of the Middle East and Africa. We see many of them coming with only the clothes they are wearing and what they can carry in one small bag. A large proportion of them are well-educated, and all have had to abandon homes, schools, and jobs. Under the direction of the First Presidency, the Church is working with 75 organizations in 17 European countries. These organizations range from large international institutions to small community initiatives, from government agencies to faith-based and secular charities. We're fortunate to partner with and learn from others who have been working with refugees around the world for many years. As members of the Church, as a people, we don't have to look back far in our history to reflect on times when we were refugees, violently driven from homes and farms over and over again. Last weekend, in speaking of refugees, Sister Linda Burton asked the women of the church to consider what if their story were my story? Their story is our story, not that many years ago. There are highly charged arguments in governments and across society regarding what is the definition of a refugee and what should be done to assist them. These thoughts are not intended in any way to form part of that heated discussion, nor to comment on anyone's immigration policy, but rather to focus on the people who have, had, who have been driven from their homes and their countries by wars that they had no hand in starting. The Savior knows how it feels to be a refugee. He was one. As a child, Jesus and his family fled to Egypt to escape the murderous swords of Herod. 
and at various points in his ministry, he found himself threatened and his life in danger, ultimately submitting to the designs of evil men who had plotted his death. Perhaps then, it is all the more remarkable to us that he repeatedly taught us to love one another, to love as he loves, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Truly pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to look to the poor and the needy and administer to their relief that they shall not suffer. It's been inspiring to witness what church members from around the world have generously donated to help these individuals and families who have lost so much. Across Europe specifically, I've seen members of the church who have experienced a joyful awakening and enriching of the soul as they have responded to that deep, innate desire to reach out and serve those in such extreme need around them. The church has provided shelter and medical care. Stakes and missions have assembled many thousands of hygiene kits. Other stakes have provided food, water, clothing, waterproof coats, bicycles, books, backpacks, reading glasses, and much more. Individuals from Scotland to Sicily have stepped in to every conceivable role. Doctors and nurses have volunteered their services at the point where refugees arrive soaked and chilled and often traumatized from their water crossings. As refugees begin the resettlement process, local members are helping them learn the language of their host country, while others are lifting the spirits of both children and parents by providing, providing toys, art supplies, music, and play. Some are taking donated yarn, knitting needles, and crochet hooks and teaching these skills to local refugees, old and young. Seasoned members of the church who have given years of service and leadership attest to the fact that ministering to these people so immediately in need has provided the richest, most fulfilling experience in their service so far. The reality of these situations must be seen to be believed. In winter, I met, amongst many others, a pregnant woman from Syria in a refugee transit camp, desperately seeking assurance that she would not need to deliver her baby on the cold floor of the vast hall where she was housed. Back in Syria, she had been a university professor. And in Greece, I spoke with a family, still wet, shivering and frightened from their crossing in a small rubber boat from Turkey. After looking into their eyes and hearing their stories, both of the terror they had fled and of their perilous journey to find refuge, I will never be the same. Extending care and aid are a vast range of dedicated relief workers many of them volunteers. I saw in action a member of the church who, for many months, worked through the night, providing for the most immediate needs of those arriving from Turkey into Greece. Among countless other endeavors, she administered first aid to those in most critical medical need. She saw that the women and children traveling alone were cared for. She held those who had been bereaved along the way and did her best to allocate limited resources to limitless need. She, as so many like her, has been a literal ministering angel whose deeds are not forgotten by those she cared for nor by the Lord on whose errand she was. All who have given of themselves to relieve the suffering around them are much like the people of Alma, and thus, in their prosperous circumstances, they did not send away any who were naked, or that were hungry, or that were athirst, or that were sick, or that had not been nourished. They were liberal to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, whether out of the church or in the church, having no respect to persons as to those who stood in need. 
We must be careful that the news of the refugees' plight does not become commonplace when the initial shock wears off and yet the wars continue and the families keep coming. Millions of refugees worldwide whose stories no longer make the news are still in desperate need of help. If you are asking, what can I do? Let us first remember that we should not serve at the expense of families and other responsibilities, nor should we expect our leaders to organize projects for us. But as youth, men, women, and families, we can join in this great humanitarian endeavor. In response to the invitation from the First Presidency to participate in Christ-like service to refugees world worldwide, the General Presidencies of the Relief Society, Young Women, and Primary have organized a relief effort entitled, I Was a Stranger. Sister Burton introduced this to the women of the church last weekend in the general women's session. There are multiple helpful ideas, resources, and suggestions for service on iwasastranger.lds.org. Begin on your knees in prayer. Then think in terms of doing something close to home, in your own community, where you will find people who need help in adapting to their new circumstances. The ultimate aim in their, is their rehabilitation to an industrious and self-reliant life. The possibilities for us to lend a hand and be a friend are endless. You might help resettle refugees, learn their host country language, update their work skills, or practice job interviewing. You could offer to mentor a family or a single mother as they transition to an unfamiliar culture even with something as simple as accompanying them to the grocery store or to school. Some wards and stakes have existing, trusted organizations to partner with, and according to your circumstances, you can give to the Church's extraordinary humanitarian effort. Additionally, each one of us can increase our awareness of world events that drive these families from their homes. We must take a stand against intolerance and advocate respect and understanding across cultures and traditions. Meeting refugee families and hearing their stories with your own ears and not from a screen or newspaper will change you. Real friendships will develop and will foster compassion and successful integration. The Lord has instructed us that the stakes of Zion are to be a defense and a refuge from the storm. We have found refuge. Let us come out from our safe places and share with them from our abundance, hope for a brighter future, faith in God and in our fellow man, and love that sees beyond cultural and ideological differences to the glorious truth that we are all children of our Father in heaven. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Being a refugee may be a defining moment in the lives of those who are refugees, but being a refugee does not define them. Like countless thousands before them, this will be a period, we hope a short period, in their lives. Some of them will go on to be Nobel laureates, public servants, physicians, scientists, musicians, artists, religious leaders, and, and contributors in other fields. Indeed, many of them were these things before they lost everything. This moment does not define them, but our response will help define us. Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, brethren. On a signal from the conductor, the congregation will stand and join in singing with the choir 
guide us, O thou great Jehovah. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elders Kent F. Richards and Paul V. Johnson of the Seventy. The choir will then sing, The Day Dawn is Breaking. This is the 186th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Central to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the Father's plan of salvation for the eternal progress of his children. That plan, explained in modern revelation, helps us understand many things we face in mortality. My message focuses on the essential role of opposition in that plan. The purpose of mortal life for the children of God is to provide the experiences needed to progress toward perfection and ultimately realize their divine destiny as an heir of eternal life. As President Monson taught us so powerfully this morning, we progress by making choices by which we are tested to show that we will keep God's commandments. To be tested, we must have the agency to choose between alternatives. To provide alternatives on which to exercise our agency, we must have opposition. The rest of the plan is also essential. When we make wrong choices, as we inevitably will, we are soiled by sin and must be cleansed to proceed toward our eternal destiny. The Father's plan provides the way to do this, the way to satisfy the eternal demands of justice. 
A Savior pays the price to redeem us from our sins. That Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the Eternal Father, whose atoning sacrifice, whose suffering, pays the price for our sins if we will repent of them. One of the best explanations of the planned role of opposition is in the Book of Mormon, in Lehi's teachings to his son Jacob. It must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. As a result, Lehi continued, the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore, man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other." End of quote. Similarly, in modern revelation, the Lord declares, it must needs be that the devil should tempt the children of men or they could not be agents unto themselves." End of quote. Opposition was necessary in the Garden of Eden. If Adam and Eve had not made the choice that introduced mortality, Lehi taught, they would have remained in a state of innocence, doing no good, for they knew no sin. From the beginning, agency and opposition were central to the Father's plan and to Satan's rebellion against it. As the Lord revealed to Moses, in the council of heaven, Satan sought to destroy the agency of man. That destruction was inherent in the terms of Satan's offer. He came before the Father and said, Behold, here am I, send me, I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that not one soul shall be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor." Thus Satan proposed to carry out the Father's plan in a way that would prevent the accomplishment of the Father's purpose and give Satan his glory. Satan's proposal would have ensured perfect equality. It would redeem all mankind that not one soul would be lost. There would be no agency or choice by anyone, and therefore no need for opposition. There would be no test, no failure, and no success. There would be no growth to attain the purpose the Father desired for His children. The scriptures record that Satan's opposition resulted in a war in heaven in which two-thirds of the children of God earned the right to experience mortal life by choosing the Father's plan and rejecting Satan's rebellion. Satan's purpose was to give himself the Father's honor and power. Wherefore, the Father said, because that Satan rebelled against me, I caused that he should be cast down with all the spirits who had exercised their agency to follow him. Cast down as unembodied spirits in mortality, Satan and his followers tempt and seek to deceive and captivate the children of God. So it is that the evil one who opposed and sought to destroy the Father's plan, actually facilitated it, because it is opposition that enables choice, and it is the opportunity of making the right choices that leads to the growth that is the purpose of the Father's plan. Significantly, the temptation to sin is not the only kind of opposition in mortality. Father Lehi taught that if the fall had not taken place, Adam and Eve would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery. Without the experience of opposition in mortality, 
all things must needs be a compound in one, in which there would be no happiness or misery. Therefore, Father Lehi continued, after God had created all things, to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being bitter, or the one being sweet, and the other bitter. His teaching on this plan, part of the plan of salvation concludes with these words, quote, Behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Opposition in the difficult circumstances we face in mortality is also part of the plan that furthers our growth in mortality. All of us experience oppositions that test us. Some of these tests are temptations to sin. Some are mortal challenges apart from personal sin. Some are very great. Some are minor. Some are continuous. Some are mere episodes. None of us is exempt. Opposition permits us to grow toward what our Heavenly Father would have us become. After Joseph Smith had completed translating the Book of Mormon, he still had to find a publisher. This was not easy. The complexity of this lengthy manuscript and the cost of printing and binding thousands of copies were intimidating. Joseph first approached E.B. Grandin, a Palmyra printer, who refused. He then sought another printer in Palmyra, who also turned him down. He traveled to Rochester, 25 miles away, and approached the most prominent publisher in western New York, who also turned him down. Another Rochester publisher was willing, but circumstances made this alternative unacceptable. Weeks had passed and Joseph must have been bewildered at the opposition to accomplishing his divine mandate. The Lord did not make it easy, but he did make it possible. Joseph's fifth attempt, a second approach to the Palmyra publisher Grandin, was successful. Years later, Joseph was painfully imprisoned in Liberty Jail for many months. When he prayed for relief, the Lord told him that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. We're all acquainted with other kinds of mortal opposition not caused by our personal sins, including illness, disability, and death. President Thomas S. Monson explained, quote, some of you may at times have cried out in your suffering, wondering why our Heavenly Father would allow you to go through whatever trials you are facing. Our mortal life, however, was never meant to be easy or consistently pleasant. Our Heavenly Father knows that we learn and grow and become refined through hard challenges, heartbreaking sorrows, and difficult choices. Each one of us experiences dark days when loved ones pass away, painful times when our health is lost, feelings of being forsaken when those we love seem to have abandoned us. These and other trials present us with the real test of our ability to endure." End of quote. Our efforts to improve our observance of the Sabbath day pose a less stressful example of opposition. We have the Lord's commandment to honor the Sabbath. Some of our choices may violate that commandment, but other choices in how to spend time on the Sabbath are simply a question of whether we will do what is merely good or what is better or best. To illustrate the opposition of temptation, the Book of Mormon describes three methods the devil will use in the last days. First, he will rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up to anger against that which is good. Second, he will pacify and lull members away into carnal security, saying, Zion prospereth, all is well. 
Third, he will tell us, there is no hell and I am no devil for there is none. And therefore there is no right and wrong. Because of this opposition, we are warned not to be at ease in Zion. The church in its divine mission and we in our personal lives seem to face increasing opposition today. Perhaps as the church grows in strength and we members grow in faith and obedience, Satan increases the strength of his opposition so we will continue to have opposition in all things. Some of this opposition even comes from church members. Some who use personal reasoning or wisdom to resist prophetic direction give themselves a label borrowed from elected bodies, the loyal opposition. However appropriate for a democracy, there's no warrant for this concept in the government of God's kingdom, where questions are honored, but opposition is not. As another example, there are many things in our early church history, such as what Joseph Smith did or did not do in every circumstance, that some use as a basis for opposition. To all, I say, exercise faith and put reliance on the Savior's teaching that we should know them by their fruits. The church is making great efforts to be transparent with the records we have. But after all we can publish, our members are sometimes left with basic questions that cannot be resolved by study. That is the church history version of opposition in all things. Some things can only be learned by faith. Our ultimate reliance must be faith in the witness we have received from the Holy Ghost. God rarely infringes on the agency of any of his children by intervening against some for the relief of others. But he does ease the burdens of our afflictions and strengthen us to bear them, as he did for Alma's people in the land of Helam. He does not prevent all disasters, but he does answer our prayers as he did with the uniquely powerful cyclone that threatened to prevent the dedication of the temple in Fiji. Or he does blunt their effects, as he did with the terrorist bombing that took so many lives in the Brussels airport, but only injured our four missionaries. Through all mortal opposition, we have God's assurance that he will consecrate our afflictions for our gain. We have also been taught to understand our mortal experiences and His commandments in the context of His great plan of salvation, which tells us the purpose of life and gives us the assurance of a Savior, in whose name I testify of the truth of these things, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Just a few months before the death of the prophet Joseph Smith, he met with the 12 apostles to talk about the greatest needs the church was facing in that very difficult time. He told them, we need the temple more than anything else. Surely today in these trying times, each of us and our families need the temple more than anything else. During a recent temple dedication, I was thrilled with the entire experience. I loved the open house, greeting many of the visitors who came to see the temple, the cultural celebration with the vibrancy and excitement of the youth, followed by the wonderful dedicatory sessions. The spirit was sweet. Many people were blessed. And then the next morning, my wife and I entered the baptismal font to participate in baptisms for some of our own ancestors. As I raised my arm to begin the ordinance, I was nearly overcome by the power of the Spirit. I realized again that the real power of the temple is in the ordinances. 
As the Lord has revealed, the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood is found in the temple and its ordinances, quote, for therein are the keys of the holy priesthood ordained, that you may receive honor and glory. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. This promise is for you and for your family. Our responsibility is to receive that which our Father offers. For unto him that receiveth it shall be given more abundantly, even power, power to receive all that he can and will give us now and eternally, power to become sons and daughters of God, to know the powers of heaven, to speak in his name, and to receive the power of his Spirit. These powers become available personally to each one of us through the ordinances and covenants of the temple. Nephi saw our day and his great vision. I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God that it descended upon the saints of the Church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. I had the privilege recently of being in a temple open house with President Russell M. Nelson and his family as he gathered them around the ceiling altar and explained to them that everything we do in the Church, every meeting, activity, lesson, and service, is to prepare each of us to come to the temple and kneel at the altar to receive all the Father's promised blessings for eternity. As we feel the blessings of the temple in our own lives, our hearts turn to our families, both living and dead. Recently, I witnessed a three-generation family participate in baptisms together for their ancestors. Even the grandmother participated, though she had some trepidation about going under the water herself. As she emerged from the water and hugged her husband, she had tears of joy. The grandfather and father then baptized each other and many of the grandchildren. What greater joy could a family experience together? Each temple has a family priority time to allow you as a family to schedule time in the baptistry. Shortly before his death, President Joseph F. Smith received the vision of the redemption of the dead. He taught that those who are in the spirit world are fully dependent upon the ordinances that we receive on their behalf. The scripture reads, the dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God. We receive the ordinances in their behalf, but they make and are held accountable for each covenant associated with each ordinance. Surely the veil is thin for us and parts completely for them in the temple. What then is our personal responsibility to be engaged in this work, both as patrons and as workers? The Prophet Joseph Smith taught the Saints in 1840 that, quote, considerable exertion must be made and means will be required. And as the work to build the temple must be hastened in righteousness, it behooves the Saints to weigh the importance of these things in their minds and then take such steps as are necessary to carry them into operation and arming themselves with courage, resolve to do all they can and feel themselves as much interested as though the whole labor depended on themselves alone." Close quote. In the book of Revelation we read, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Can't you just see in your mind's eye those who serve in the temple today? There are more than 120,000 ordinance workers in the 150 operating temples around the world. Yet there is opportunity for even more to have this sweet experience. When President Gordon B. Hinckley announced the concept of many smaller temples throughout the world, he taught that, quote, all ordinance workers would be local people who would serve in other capacities in their wards and stakes, end quote. 
Normally, workers are called to serve for two to three years, with the possibility of extending beyond. It is not intended that once you are called, you will stay as long as you are able. Many long-serving workers carry their love for the temple with them as they are released and allow other new workers to serve. Nearly 100 years ago, Apostle John A. Widso taught, quote, We need more workers to accomplish this wonderful work. We need more converts to temple work drawn from all ages. The time has come in this new temple movement to bring into active service all the people of all ages. Temple work is of as much benefit to the young and the active as it is to the aged who have laid behind them many of the burdens of life. The young man needs his place in the temple even more than his father and his grandfather, who are steadied by a life of experience. And the young girl, just entering life, needs the spirit, influence, and direction that come from participating in the temple ordinances." End quote. In many temples, temple presidents are welcoming newly called and endowed missionaries young men and women to serve for just a short time as ordinance workers before going to the MTC. These young people are not only blessed to serve, but they enhance the beauty and spirit for all serving in the temple. I asked a number of young men and women who have served before and after their missions to share their feelings. They used phrases like the following to describe their experience in the temple. Quote, when I serve in the temple, I feel a sense of being closer to my Father and the Savior. I feel complete peace and happiness. I have a feeling of being home. I receive sacredness, power, and strength. I feel the importance of my sacred covenants. The temple has become a part of me. Those whom we serve are close during the ordinances. It gives me the strength to overcome temptations and the temple has changed my life forever." End quote. Serving in the temple is a rich and powerful experience for people of all ages. Even some newly married couples are serving together. President Nelson has taught service in the temple is a sublime activity for a family. As ordinance workers, in addition to receiving ordinances for your ancestors, you can also officiate in ordinances for them. As Wilford Woodruff said, What greater calling can any man or woman have on the face of the earth than to hold in his or her hands power and authority to go forth and administer in the ordinances of salvation? You become an instrument in the hands of God in the salvation of that soul. There is nothing given to the children of men that is equal to it. He continues, The sweet whisperings of the Holy Spirit will be given to you and the treasures of heaven, the communion of angels, will be added from time to time. This is worth all you or I can sacrifice during the few years we have to spend here in the flesh." End quote. President Monson recently reminded us that the blessings of the temple are priceless. No sacrifice is too great. Come to the temple. Come often. Come with and for your family. Come and help others to come, too. What are these which are arrayed in white? My brothers and sisters, you are they. You who have received the ordinances of the temple, who have kept your covenants even by sacrifice, and you who are helping your families find the blessings of temple service, and who have helped others along the way, thank you for your service. I testify that each temple is His holy, sacred house and that therein each of us may learn and know the powers of godliness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. A week ago was Easter, and our thoughts were focused again on the atoning sacrifice and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This past year, I have been thinking and pondering about the resurrection more than normal. Nearly one year ago, our daughter Elisa died. She had struggled with cancer for almost eight years, with several surgeries, many different treatments, exciting miracles, and deep disappointments. 
We watched her physical condition deteriorate as she came to the close of her mortal life. It was excruciating to see that happen to our precious daughter, that bright-eyed little baby who'd grown up to be a talented, wonderful woman, wife, and mother. I thought my heart would break. Last Easter, a little over a month before she passed away, Elisa wrote, Easter is a reminder of all that I hope for for myself, that someday I will be healed and someday I will be whole. Someday I won't have any metal or plastic inside of me. Someday my heart will be free of fear and my mind free of anxieties. I'm not praying for that, that this happens soon, but I'm so glad I truly believe in a beautiful afterlife. The resurrection of Jesus Christ ensures the very things Elisa hoped for and instills in each of us a reason for the hope that is in us. President Gordon B. Hinckley referred to the resurrection as the greatest of all events in the history of mankind. The resurrection is brought to pass by the Atonement of Jesus Christ and is pivotal to the great plan of salvation. We are spirit children of heavenly parents. When we come to this earth life, our spirit is united with our body. We experience all the joys and challenges associated with mortal life. When a person dies, their spirit is separated from their body. Resurrection makes it possible for a person's spirit and body to be united again. Only this time, that body will be immortal and perfect, not subject to pain, disease, or other problems. After resurrection, the spirit will never again be separated from the body because the Savior's resurrection brought total victory over death. In order to obtain our eternal destiny, we need to have this immortal soul a spirit and body united forever. With spirit and immortal body inseparably connected, we can receive a fullness of joy. In fact, without the resurrection, we could never receive a fullness of joy, but would be miserable forever. Even faithful, righteous people view the separation of their bodies from their spirits as captivity. We are released from this captivity through the resurrection, which is redemption from the bands or chains of death. There is no salvation without both our spirit and our body. Each of us has physical, mental, and emotional limitations and weaknesses. These challenges, some of which seem so intractable now, will eventually be resolved. None of these problems will plague us after we are resurrected. Elisa researched survival rates for persons with the type of cancer she had, and the numbers were not encouraging. She wrote, But there is a cure, so I'm not scared. Jesus has already cured my cancer and yours. We can replace the word cancer with any of the other physical, mental, or emotional ailments we may face. Because of the resurrection, they have already been cured, too. The miracle of resurrection, the ultimate cure, is beyond the power of modern medicine, but it's not beyond the power of God. We know it can be done because the Savior is resurrected and will bring to pass the resurrection of each of us, too. The resurrection of the Savior proves that He is the Son of God and that what He taught is real. He is risen, as He said. There could be no stronger proof of His divinity than Him coming forth from the grave with an immortal body. We know of witnesses to the resurrection in New Testament times. In addition to the women and men we read about in the Gospels, the New Testament assures us that hundreds actually saw the resurrected Lord. And the Book of Mormon tells of many hundreds more. 
the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side. And they did see with their eyes, and did feel with their hands, and did know of a surety, and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. To those ancient witnesses are added witnesses in the latter days. In fact, in the opening scene of this dispensation, Joseph Smith saw the resurrected Savior with the Father. Living prophets and apostles have testified of the reality of the resurrected living Christ. So we may say, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And each of us can be part of a cloud of witnesses who knows through the power of the Holy Ghost that what we celebrate on Easter actually happened, that the resurrection is real. The reality of the resurrection of the Savior overwhelms our heartbreak with hope because with it comes the assurance that all the other promises of the gospel are just as real, promises that are no less miraculous than the resurrection. We know He has the power to cleanse us from all our sins. We know He has taken upon Himself all our infirmities, pains, and the injustices we have suffered. We know that He has risen from the dead with healing in His wings. We know that He can make us whole no matter what is broken in us. We know that He shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. We know that we can be made perfect through Jesus who wrought out this perfect atonement if we will just have faith and follow Him. Toward the end of the inspiring oratorio Messiah, Handel put to beautiful music the Apostle Paul's words that rejoice over the resurrection. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for the blessings that are ours because of the atonement and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. For all who've laid a child in the grave, or wept over the casket of a spouse, or grieved over the death of a parent or someone they loved, the resurrection is a source of great hope. What a powerful experience it will be to see them again, not just as spirits, but with resurrected bodies. I long to see my mother again and feel her gentle touch and look into her loving eyes. I want to see my father smile and hear his laugh and see him as a resurrected, perfect being. With an eye of faith, I picture Elisa completely beyond the reach of any earthly troubles or any sting of death, a resurrected, perfected Elisa, victorious and with a fullness of joy. A few Easter's ago, she wrote simply, Life through His name, so much hope, always, through everything. I love Easter to remind me. I testify of the reality of the resurrection. Jesus Christ lives, and because of Him, we will all live again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
brothers and sisters, dear friends, as we come to the conclusion of this wonderful General Conference, we express sincere appreciation and extend our blessings to all who have worked so diligently to prepare for these services. We thank those who have spoken and those who have provided the uplifting music. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this conference by singing, Sing, We Now at Parting. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Shane M. Bone of the Seventy, and this general conference will be adjourned. Brothers and sisters, do you have any idea? Do you have any notion or inkling whatsoever of how much we love you? For 10 hours, you watch fixed on one face at this pulpit sequentially. But for those same 10 hours, those of us seated behind this pulpit are fixed on you. You thrill us to the center of our soul. whether that's the 21,000 here in the conference center or multitudes in meeting houses and chapels or finally millions around the globe in homes in some distant location, maybe huddled around a family computer screen. There you are, here you are hour after hour in your Sunday best, being your best. You sing and you pray wherever you are in the world. You listen and you believe. You are the miracle of this church and we love you. What a, another remarkable, wonderful general conference we've had. We've especially been blessed by President Monson's presence and his prophetic messages. President, we love you. We pray for you. We thank you. And above all, we sustain you. We're grateful to have been taught by you and your marvelous counselors and so many of our other great men and women leaders who have come to this pulpit. We've heard again and again, always incomparable music. We've been urgently prayed for and pled with Truly, the Spirit of the Lord has been here in rich abundance. What an inspirational weekend it has been, again, in every way. Now, I do see a couple of problems. <laughs> One is the fact that I am the only person standing between you and the ice cream you always have ready at the close of general conference. <laughs> I feel the weight of that burden. <laughs> the other potential problem is captured in this photo that I saw recently on the internet.
Now, my apologies to all the children who are now under the sofa. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, none of us want tomorrow or the day after that to destroy the wonderful feelings we have had this weekend. We want to hold fast to the spiritual impressions we've had and the inspired teachings we have heard. But it's inevitable that after heavenly moments in our lives, we of necessity return to earth, so to speak, where sometimes less than ideal circumstances again face us. Paul warned us of this when he wrote, Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. That post-illumination affliction can come in many ways, and it can come to all of us. Surely every missionary who has ever served soon realized that life in the field wasn't going to be quite like the rarefied atmosphere of the Missionary Training Center. So too, for all of us, upon leaving a sweet session in the temple or concluding a particularly spiritual sacrament meeting. Remember that when Moses came down from his singular experience on Mount Sinai, he found his people had corrupted themselves, it said, and had turned aside quickly. There they were at the foot of the mountain, busily fashioning a gold calf to worship in the very hour that Jehovah at the summit of the mountain had been telling Moses, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Moses was not happy with his flock of wandering Israelites that day. During his earthly ministry, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration, where the scriptures say, his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. The heavens opened, ancient prophets came, and God the Father spoke. After such a celestial experience, what does Jesus come down the mountain to find? Well, first, an argument between his disciples and their antagonists over a failed blessing administered to a young boy. Then he tried to convince the twelve, unsuccessfully it turns out, that he would soon be delivered up to local rulers who would kill him. Then someone reminded that a tax was due, which was forthrightly paid. Then he had to rebuke some of the brethren because they were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. All of this led him to say, O faithless generation, how long shall I suffer you? He had occasion to ask that question more than once during his ministry. No wonder he longed for the prayerful solitude of mountaintops. Realizing that we all have to come down from peak experiences to deal with the regular vicissitudes of life, may I offer this encouragement as General Conference concludes. First of all, if in the days ahead you see not only limitations in those around you, but also find elements in your own life that don't yet measure up to the messages you've heard this weekend, Please don't be cast down in spirit and don't give up. The gospel, the church, these wonderful semi-annual gatherings are intended to give hope and inspiration. They're not intended to discourage you. Only the adversary, the enemy of us all, would try to convince us that the ideals outlined in General Conference are depressing and unrealistic that people don't really improve, that no one really progresses. And why does Lucifer give that speech? Because he knows he can't improve. He can't progress. That world's without end, he will never have a bright tomorrow. He's a miserable man, 
bound by eternal limitations, and he wants you to be miserable too. Well, don't fall for that. With the gift of the atonement of Jesus Christ and the strength of heaven to help us, we can improve. And the great thing about the gospel is we get credit for trying, even if we don't always succeed. When there was a controversy in the early church regarding who was entitled to heaven's blessings and who wasn't, the Lord declared to the prophet Joseph Smith, Verily I say unto you, the gifts of God are given for the benefit of those who love me and keep my commandments and for them that seeketh so to do. Boy, aren't we all thankful for that added provision? <laughs> and seeketh so to do. That's been a lifesaver because sometimes that's all we can offer. We take some solace in the fact that if God were to reward only the perfectly faithful, he wouldn't have much of a distribution list. Please, please remember tomorrow and all the days after that, that the Lord blesses those who want to improve who accept the need for commandments and try to keep them, who cherish Christ-like virtues and strive to the best of their ability to acquire them. If you stumble in that pursuit, so does everyone. The Savior is there to help you keep going. If you fall, Summon his strength. Call out like Alma, O oh, Jesus, have mercy on me. He'll help you get back up. He'll help you repent and repair and fix whatever you have to fix and keep going. Soon enough, you'll have the success that you seek. As you desire of me, so it shall be done unto you, the Lord has declared. Put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good, yea, to do justly, to walk humbly, to judge righteously. Then whatsoever you desire of me in righteousness, you shall receive. I love that doctrine. It says again and again, and again, that we're going to be blessed for our desire to do good even as we actually strive to be so. And it reminds us that to qualify for those blessings, we must make certain we do not deny them to others. We are to deal justly, never unjustly, never unfairly. We're to walk humbly never arrogantly, never pridefully. We're to judge righteously, never self-righteously or unrighteously. My brothers and sisters, the first great commandment of all eternity is to love God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. That's the first great commandment. But the first great truth of all eternity is that God loves us with all of his heart, might, mind, and strength. That love is the foundation stone of eternity. And it should be the foundation stone of our daily life. Indeed, it is only with that reassurance burning in our soul that we can have the confidence to keep trying to improve, keep seeking forgiveness for our sins, and keep extending that grace to our neighbor. President George Q. Cannon once taught, no matter how serious the trial, how deep the distress, how great the affliction, 
God will never desert us. He never has and he never will. He cannot do it. It is not his character to do so. He will always stand by us. We may pass through the fiery furnace. We may pass through deep waters, but we shall not be consumed nor overwhelmed. We shall emerge from all these trials and these difficulties, the better and the purer for them. Now, with that majestic devotion, ringing from heaven as the great constant in our lives, manifested most purely and perfectly in the life, death, and atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can escape the consequences of both sin and stupidity, our own or that of others, in whatever form they may come to us in the course of daily living. If we give our heart to God, if we love the Lord Jesus Christ, if we do the best we can to live the gospel, then tomorrow and every other day is ultimately going to be magnificent, even if we don't always recognize it as such. Why? Because our Heavenly Father wants it to be. He wants to bless us. A rewarding, abundant, and eternal life is the very object of His merciful plan for His children. It is a plan predicated on the truth that all things work together for good to them that love God. So keep loving, keep trying, keep trusting, keep believing, keep growing. Heaven is cheering you on today, tomorrow, and forever. Hast thou not known Hast thou not heard, Isaiah cried, God giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. They that wait upon him shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. For the Lord God will hold their right hand saying unto them, Fear not, I will help thee. Brothers and sisters, may a loving Father in heaven bless us tomorrow to remember how we felt today. May he bless us to strive with patience and persistence toward the ideals we have heard and heard proclaimed this conference weekend, knowing that his divine love and unfailing help will be with us even when we struggle. No, will be with us especially when we struggle. If gospel standards seem high and the personal improvement needed in the days ahead seems out of reach, remember Joshua's encouragement to his people when they faced a daunting future. Sanctify yourselves, he said, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I declare that same promise. It is the promise of this conference. It is the promise of this church. It is the promise of him who performs those wonders, who is himself wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Of him I bear witness. Of him I am a witness. And to him 
this conference stands as a testament of his ongoing work in this great latter day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father in heaven, we love Thee and we love Thy Son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for Thy plan of happiness. We have been instructed today, we have been edified and sanctified by the power of the Holy Ghost, and pray that we may now go forward and bind ourselves in all holiness before Thee. We pray, Father, that we may choose the 
that we may always choose the, ride, the tougher ride or the harder ride as thou has instructed us through our wonderful prophet, President Thomas Monson. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This has been a broadcast of the 186th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.